And furthermore, you can take that ugly head of hair of yours out the door. Getting cross round two. Two friends, two pastors, two theologians, pursuing spiritual life by exploring the scriptures in conversation with the fathers. I'm Dr. Wes Arblaster. And I'm Dr. Ethan Smith. And we are Mysterion. Yeah, welcome to Mysterion, everybody. Hey. (laughs) You know, I have to say, Ethan, this is the first time I've ever had you yell at me, and uh, I wasn't impressed, bro. You got to get some more practice, man. I know. I need to yell at more people. This is what I'm learning from our podcast. That's right, man. You just need to, you know, uh, on the theme of, you know, satisfaction, you just need to get it all out. Get it all out. Be more like God. (laughs) Um, On the latter view. (laughs) On the the latter view. view. Not on the earlier view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you didn't watch the last episode, you have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. If you watch the last episode, what you'll learn is... Ethan's more like Jesus, and I'm more like the Father. <laughs> oh, I thought Satan is how that sentence ends. End uh, oh man! Hey, by the way, I have to say that last episode you had you w- made one statement, and it just it you ki- it kind of I think a, maybe a lot of people missed it, but it caught me big time, and I don't even know if it's appropriate to bring up right now. <laughs> But I'm going to. <laughs> did, did I make an inappropriate statement? <laughs> I mean, no, it was it was kind of a profound statement. You said, you know, um, again, we're t- when we're talking about the latter view, the, mm-hmm. the latter view of the cross, which is something that we were ha- were immersed in growing up. The idea that what the cross was about was the son suffering in our place, mm-hmm. the wrath and the punishment, the anger of the father. Mm-hmm. You said in that in that way that in some sense the roman centurions who are basically killing ex- an innocent killing man. an innocent person for the sake of the nation or the good of the whole in some sense they represent the face or the nature of the father more more than jesus does yeah and that, that that's a profound statement now can you just say yeah. a few words about that so in that that later view right uh that we talked about that was natural to me growing up uh it's like the roman centurions were acting like the priests of god because what they were doing uh represented the father's character more than the son does to to kill an innocent victim for the sake of the good of the whole is what they're doing uh and and that makes peace and that's precisely how the Father, God the Father, is is uh, presented in that in that uh, theology, and it, it ignores the fact that Christ Himself is the High Priest of His own sacrifice. It, yeah, yeah. So 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 basically, to sum up what we explored last week, which we want to we want to dig into it more because there's a lot there. It's deep. It's complicated, mm-hmm. and and in some ways, I think we could try to clarify some of the things mm-hmm. that we said. But to sum that up, what we want to say is the early view understanding of what's happening on the cross, how God, the triune life, Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is revealed on the cross, is that Christ, Christ himself is the expression of the heart of the Father, Mm -hmm. which is one Mm -hmm. of mercy. And uh, as opposed to a a later development in Christian theology. Let's be frank, much later, even though it's natural to us, we read certain passages and we just see it. Right, which views the cross as the punishment of the Father being uh, the Father's wrath being inflicted upon the Son as a punishment. In that view, the Roman soldiers are better or more accurate depictions of the nature of the heart of the Father than Jesus Mm -hmm. is. Right. So, um, if you guys want to know more about that, and you uh, go check out our last episode, we're going to be exploring Trinity and Cross more today. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to kind of get into some new stuff, but um, I, I do think that kind of sums up what we were saying. Yeah, I think so. That, you know, at the core of it is this idea that the Christ represents the very character of the Father when he hangs on the cross, um, but ways that we have been trained and habituated into reading certain scriptures, um, that's not the case. Uh, and they have two different, you know, at, at the most sort of like um, uh, not being precise, it, it sounds like they have 
Christ and the Father have two different characters, two different personalities, which is one's not, mercy, one's one, wrath, yeah. or something like but that. But even at the level of precise uh, theology, as this gets worked out in these, you know, much, much later theologies of the cross, um, the Father's character is reflected in, you know, Pontius Pilate or 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 the uh, high priests, or excuse me, the the centurions. And, um, you know, Christ, even as Christ dies there rather than an actual criminal, the idea there is that Christ saves us by, in some sense, shielding us from the Father. Yeah. Whereas we looked at passages last week, precisely in passages where it talks most explicitly about Christ's death as a sacrifice, they're save, it's saving because it doesn't shield us from the Father, but brings us into right. the Father's presence. We are right. the ones who wandered away, and Christ to the cross is bringing us back sort of in in the in again in the later view of uh the, our salvation through the cross we could sum it up with with this statement the bottom line is for god somebody has to pay yeah that's it that's why there's a cross somebody has to pay mm -hmm. now we're not even going to get into the question about is that really justice the fact that mm -hmm. an innocent person's going to pay right um, mm -hmm. We're not even going to get into that today, but yeah. that basically, I would say, sums up the core. The core issue with us, right. I think, is that that's not that's not the nature of God. Yeah, right? and th the thing that stuck with me that you said was on that much later view. It sort of presents the idea that eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is rooted in the very nature of God. Right? Mm -hmm. You do something wrong, you just have to get it, uh, which uh, is a view of justice that was foreign to the ancient Hebrew and Christian conceptions. Um, you know, punishment was always chastisement or education. Mm -hmm. But um, but we don't have to go too deep in that. So, But last week we did that, Trinity and Cross Part 1, where we talked about how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are undivided in nature and character, and that the place to actually see that character is on the cross, most especially. So when we see Jesus on the cross, what we see, we might say, is the heart of the Father for mm -hmm, us, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. This is the m the mercy of the Father for mm -hmm. us. So um, I, I don't want to go much deeper into that, but that's basically right. what we're saying. And that's what we talked about, not having this idea of thinking of Trinity as God having multiple personalities and Jesus is the nice one and the Father is the more severe one. And also not thinking about the cross as this like puzzle God's got to work out between his grace and his justice. Right. So we, we focused a lot on that, but, but this week we're going to change it a little bit. We're going to come back to some of those themes, hopefully make them clearer, uh, but we're going to have a, a, another sort of focusing question, uh, if we can go there. So for Trinity and the Cross Part 2, we're saying the cross of Christ is not an exception in the life of the Trinity. So what, what, why are you bringing that up? What, what, what's, what's precipitating that kind of question? Okay. So in this later view that we've talked about, uh, the cross of Christ is in multiple ways presented as an exception in, in the life of the Trinity. So we think of the Trinity as a life of mutual love between the three persons who are one God. They're in perfect communion, and this is just who they are. But at the cross... Jesus acts like a high priest and, 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 you know, bears all of our burdens, whether it's pain, suffering, or sin, and presents and, and carries them on himself, which seems like not what Jesus typically does. But even more than that, on that theory, uh, what you have is the Father either, depending on which view you think about it, either sort of and still no longer being in this loving relationship with the son, he's either venting his anger and wrath and punishment and justice on the son. He's, yes, yes. Or yes. he's abandoning the son and turning away. So for the most part, the life of the Trinity is this you know, three and one, this mutual loving relationship. But at the cross, it gets ugly. It gets dark. The father, in some sense, turns against the son or, or vents his wrath or abandons him. So what you have on the cross is not a revelation of the life of the Trinity. Rather, we're trying to, in this theory, we're trying to kind of work out the mechanics of how it works. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we tend to present uh, what's revealed on the cross as a, an exception. This rare moment where the Trinity disrupts its eternal life of fellowship and love and friendship and what you get is uh, punishment and wrath, even in the life of the Trinity. Right, 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 right. So, uh, and we are saying 
not only is that not right, but in some ways it gets it exactly wrong. Yes, right? that's exactly right. Because what we want to what we want to explore today is that you know, uh, according to the, the fathers and also the way that we find it in Scripture, the cross is not so much um, a mechanical solution to a theoretical problem mm-hmm. or or even real problem. It's not a solution to the problem as much as it is the revelation, we, we've used the word theophany or manifestation, ultimately of the triune life in its fullness. So the point is, is this, it's, it's sort of like, <laughs> imagine having, you know, a portrait of a, of a, of a family, right? Mm-hmm. And that portrait of the family is supposed to represent what the family is together, right? Yeah. The cross when we look at the cross and we see Christ on the cross um, giving himself for us, that is a portrait of the Trinity. It's not mm-hmm. a portrait of mm-hmm. the exception yeah. in the life of the Trinity. Right. It is the very eternal nature of God revealed through Christ's obedient will to the Father, offering himself up in the Spirit, and we're going to find... Mm-hmm. inviting us into that life through his death. Yeah, and before we move on, let's connect this to a theme that we started our Tracing Trinity uh, series out with, where we said the revelation of the Trinity is not directed to the intellect that reasons about things and back and forth and figures out theories, but to the noose or to the spirit or the heart, mm-hmm. which is this knowledge through sharing in life. Um, it's not theoretical. It's experiential reality. And if, if, if the cross is, as we're saying, is actually a revelation of this life, then that latter view that says, well, okay, you've got God and he's perfectly just and he can't tolerate sinners, but he wants to be gracious towards us. And then, then it becomes that puzzle right. that you're, you're trying to figure out with the right theory. Right. And I would say what scriptures present and what the fathers, how they understand it is, they're saying, no, what's being put forth and the cross is the life of the Trinity to be contemplated, to be drawn into, to share experientially with, and to know in that way. And so, yeah, we're going to use a lot of words. We're going to do some arguments today, but that's all, all in aid towards a more meditative or contemplative relationship to the cross as this is the unveiling, right? Unveiling of the life of the Trinity. And what we see here is the eternal life of the Trinity, made known in our world so yeah but the way we're going to do it i think is going to be kind of interesting because we're actually going to dive into a passage that on the surface doesn't look like it's about trinity and doesn't look like it's about the cross but what we're going to find is it absolutely is right and it's 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 really one that would for that latter view it really hard when you understand this passage's relationship with the cross it's very hard to then make sense of it right we're actually going to jesus and his the sermon um sermon on the mount all right. Um, or, uh, right? On or Sermon on the Plain, because we'll be in Luke. Luke, Luke, but Sermon on the Plain. Real quickly, this is how we're going to break it down. We're going to have two moments in what we're presenting here by, by saying that this is an exception. The first moment is to say that the cross of Christ reveals the eternal, unchanging life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what we see there is what's unchanging about God, not this weird exception, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're going to uh, go to Luke 6, 27, 36. Do you mind? I'll read, and then you can say some words, all right? I'll say words. You say words. This is Jesus speaking. It's the Sermon on the Plain. And he says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. And then I'm jumping down a little bit. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and, and here are the key words, you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful." Luke 6, 27 through 36. Yeah, the way that I'm familiar with reading this passage is as kind of like a series of ethical codes that, that or morals that Jesus is uh, putting out there for us. Do this, don't do this. Mm-hmm. 
it's it's um the you know the equivalent of you know don't don't lie don't chew don't go out with girls you know who do you know so but this is more severe right mm-hmm. yeah like right. this is sort of like well who could ever live this way mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. i mean and so it just seems like jesus is radical ethics and uh but i think what we find if we first of all look at the description that he gives it's 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 really i think it's really fascinating this could be a description of the final days and hours of jesus's life absolutely right yes I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. That's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. And in fact, in the Gospel of Luke, the same Gospel, Luke writes in such a way that it's very clear. It's right? directly connected that, with this. Connected yes. this. this, is, this these commands are a description of Christ at the cross. Right. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat. I mean, this is a description of the passion mm. of Christ, right? If we were to step back, there's also do not judge and you won't be judged. Right, and right. That's is where he forgives uh, He forgives the uh, the other man being crucified. Go on. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, but love your enemies, do good, lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be, and this is this is my point here, be sons of the Most High. In other words, who is the Son of the Most High? Well, it's Jesus Christ yeah. himself. Mm-hmm. So what he's describing here is what he actually is. He mm-hmm. says, live this life. Let this life be in you. Mm-hmm. Um, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. And so what's wonderful about this is he's describing this as, a, a, as an account of his own life that he wants us to share mm-hmm. in. But then he goes on to say, and this life mirrors the Father's. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so this is a description of Christ, but then Christ himself says what this is is a conformity to the Father. Right, we are to be merciful just as the Father is merciful, and uh, you know this is a parallel passage to the Gospel, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and the Gospel of Matthew, which is interesting to me because again, what struck in my mind last week, Wes, is when you you said so well in that later theory, that sort of mechanics theory of this is how it works and this is why it has to be this way. Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth is like lodged in the very nature of God. And in in the Matthew passage, Christ says, you've heard it said, but now I tell you. And he gives you all these commands and then says, be perfect as your father is perfect. We're here, be merciful as your father is merciful. Those eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is not an expression, unless we understand it properly, which is actually a limiting how much revenge you could do. Um, uh, but, But what's going on here is Christ is describing himself, putting it out as commands, and then saying this is in perfect conformity to the father. In other words... Christ and the Father, and of course the Spirit, they are the basis. They are the basis of the life that would uh, give, uh, let's see this, where do I want to go to? Um, you know, treat others the same way you want them to treat you, or um, give to whoever asks. You know, hold nothing back. These aren't just, as you said, high ethical standards, but this is the life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So that's what I want to get to because I think that I think some people would be like, okay, yeah, I can kind of see that. So, so the the cross isn't an exception to the character and the nature and the life of Jesus. It is all one. It's all mm-hmm. one piece. In fact, it's the fullest expression of mm-hmm. Jesus's giving, self loving, merciful life, right? But there's m- it goes deeper than that, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. it's not merely we're not merely saying this is an expression of Jesus. But this account, what Jesus describes here, this form of life is actually the form of the eternal life Mm -hmm. of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Completely apart, if we're gonna, for for a moment, if we step step aside and say, we're not talking just about uh, people that are doing wrong or you know people that are wounding us or people that are abusing us we're talking about the eternal life of god having a shape or a character mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that character is one of giving utterly selflessly without expecting return this is what we've said about mm-hmm. the nature of the father gives completely selflessly to the son in the spirit and the son receives everything and 
in the spirit returns that gift back to the father completely not holding back anything of mm-hmm, himself mm-hmm. in that way there this is actually this is actually the description of the triune life yes. expressed in its how do i say in a tragic situation i think you want to talk yeah, about that. yeah yeah so this is uh, if the life of the trinity is eternally this ungrasping selfless giving of one to another in return a love that holds nothing back who has no regard for self for the sake of the other what does that look like when it plays out in a world full of sin death and the devil uh, and this is what's going on here. So there was a movie. I think this was the movie we watched years ago called uh, To End All Wars, mm-hmm. which is actually the same characters as you would have in the movie The Bridge Over the River Kwai. It, it takes place in uh, World War II, mm-hmm. I believe. A Japanese the, prison camp. A campaign. Japanese prison camp, which was absolutely brutal. Some allied soldiers get captured there, and uh, the Japanese prison camps were terrible. They were torture and killings and beatings all the time. The movie documents this, and the, the, the living situation is quite bad, and, and so the men decide they got to do something to keep their sanity. So they put together this like little university. They do various things, but what they decide to do at one point is because one was like a, a, uh, an actor in, in Great Britain, and he was like a Shakespearean actor. So what they decide to do is to put on a play, and I think they did uh, Hamlet or Macbeth. I'm not sure which one. And so what they had to do was, uh, in this makeshift place, using the very instruments of their misery, right? So think about that, that British actor. Back in Great Britain, he had the finest stage in which to play out this Shakespearean play with the finest props and the finest costumes and the finest outfits, and that's Shakespeare. That's the story of Hamlet, right? But what they did is, in the prison camp, they used the rags that they had instead of the fine costumes. And they used the stuff of their everyday life that was used to sort of make their life harsh and horrible. And they put on a play of Hamlet. Now, it's still Shakespeare. It's still Hamlet, but it's in a prison camp, right? It's that same story. It's that same life. It's still Shakespeare in a tragic situation. And so it, it's the same, but it looks different. Right. And so what's being described here and what we see on the cross is, so to speak, the eternal life of the Trinity played out in the prison camp of sin and death and the devil. So right? when he says, for example, whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. This is the selfless love that is the very life of Father, Son, and Holy mm-hmm. Spirit, right? The, this glorious, eternal, beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. But it has this sort of tragic character because it's being played out in a in the land of sin, death, and, mm-hmm. and evil. Yeah. And so when you give yourself selflessly in our world, when you live, when you participate in the life of the Trinity in our selfless world, you will end up persecuted, right? Mm-hmm. You will end up in a situation where um, you have to live an ascetical life, we'll say those things mm-hmm. will be oftentimes will be taken from you. Right? Yeah, right. You will live. You will live a life that, in many ways, uh, has a cross to it. Exactly. Right. So, but the so the point here is this: is for well, we would encourage people to read this passage mm-hmm. while thinking. Trinity, yeah, while yeah. thinking I mean, the triune life. I think the Father holds nothing back from the Son. The Son holds nothing back from the Father. That's what that life looks like in a world full of people who take and abuse and beat, right? right. That's what it looks like. And finally, it looks like the cross. So if we are, this is, this is the point. So if we, if, we, if we enter into this, if we are obedient to Christ and we accept the invitation of this kind of life, we can expect some of these difficult things to come our way, but we can also expect the very joy and peace mm-hmm. of the eternal life of God mm-hmm. to be starting to mark our own life. Our own yeah, yeah, there's resurrection there, right? So so that's a good transition point because so far we've been saying the cross is not an exception to the life of the Trinity, but rather it's its revelation. But wait, there's more. There's more. 
So the second move we want to say is, by the cross, Christ and the Spirit gather us into the eternal and unchanging life of the Trinity. So it's not just that at the cross we can see that life of self-giving love, selfless love, but actually at the cross, this is where we are being included and gathered in and given this life to share in it. Yeah. Yeah. How does that happen, Ethan? <laughs> How does that happen, Wes? <laughs> you just hand the baton back to me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think this is wonderful. So when when we said um, when we say what happens on the cross, we say we, you know we say the cross is a revelation, right? Mm-hmm. It's a it's a manifestation, it's a theophany, it's an appearance of the life of of the triune God, right? Yes. But there's also something accomplished, right? There's something accomplished in the cross, and the accomplish what's accomplished again to echo last week isn't God changes his mood. No, there's no yeah. change on God's side, but what's accomplished is we are, are drawn in through Christ, through His sacrifice, through His death. We are drawn in to share in that life, um, and so we ourselves are. We'll, we'll we're going to find the language. We are adopted, and mm-hmm. we participate um, in the um, eternal life of God, the mingling, as we described last week, the mingling Mm -hmm. um, of our corruptible nature with the incorruptible Mm -hmm. transforms us. And we're going to see, we're going to see what that looks like, right? So we're going to read a passage out of Colossians that deals with some of this. Uh, But you could also reference back our conversation last week to Hebrews 9. There's a lot Mm -hmm. to say there as well. Well, How about I read this? Okay. You're always reading. Jeez. Hogging. All right. So this is uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1. For he, Christ, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Actually, it's the Father, isn't it? In whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. Maybe you should read it. (laughs) I just totally screwed that up. And we wonder why I read (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, let's do it again. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things having been created through him and for him, for he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Thanks, Wes. You're welcome. That was, that was expert reading. Round two is better. Yeah. So we have this somewhat famous passage of uh, what, and what might very well have been a hymn in the ancient church. And typically on, a, say, a theology podcast what you talk about here is the fact that christ is being presented as god and this is proof of his divinity and yes 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 of course we agree with that Uh, but this passage is also presenting christ as the high priest all of this language here is actually drawn from hebrew tradition about what the high priest at least symbolically did in offering the life of israel or the life of the hebrew people um, to god the father in the temple. And uh, I think what we want to focus on here, so if we can go back here. Of course, we have this, this uh, language of, of being transferred to the kingdom of the beloved son. Um, well, let's back up a second. And then it goes on to characterize Christ as the image of the invisible God and so forth. So, you know what? I'm stuck on where to start explaining this, to tell you the truth. That's all right. I think I think I think one of the first things that we need to say um, is that when Christ, w- w- what's described here, the very nature of Christ, we'd say is is a very high view of Jesus Christ. Yes. He's 
Christ is divine, right? He's creator yeah, and savior. That's true. But the all, the opposite is also true because in here he sums up everything, mm-hmm. right? A, of our cre- creaturely world, our universe. By him all things were created, all things hold together in him, mm-hmm. right? He is the the first inheritor of all creation. All things are in some sense within Christ, he's saying. Yeah. So it's not just saying Christ has this high status, but you, me, our world is in some sense inside mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. within the second person of the Trinity. We yeah. share in the life of the Son through the Son, mm-hmm. right? And uh, it's going to actually be, that's actually going to be key to us understanding, I think, the cross as being a revelation yeah. of the eternal life of God. Right? Yeah, so the first half of this passage presents him as the creator, but the one who contains and holds together everything. He's the center of everything. It's all within him. And then the second half of the passage here presents him as then making peace. Uh, uh, 20. 20, right? Through him, Christ to reconcile all things to himself. Now that harkens back to last week's conversation, right? God is never reconciled to us. We're always reconciled to God. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through whom I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. So there's a picture here of somehow by his cross, Christ reconciles in this passage everything mm-hmm. to God. And in fact, it's, it's the language, again, this is very priestly language because it's by the blood of his cross. And we should talk about that word blood just a little bit because this is a presentation of Christ as a sort of cosmic high priest and then the whole cosmos is having a like day of atonement right and if you read Leviticus 16 and you see how in the old temple which was a shadow of this right a copy of this uh, there was the goat that got sacrificed as well as a bull and they were taken into the holy of holies into God's presence and we tend to think what's presented is the killing or the death. But again and again and again, Leviticus 16, what's made very clear here is that the blood, it keeps saying again and again, is that the life is in the blood. All throughout Leviticus it says this. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. So so bringing the blood into the Holy of Holies was not about bringing death into the Holy of Holies, but life. And that life, which represented the life of Israel in the old days, right, was then mingled with the life of God, right? To hearken back to our conversation last week. And here, Christ is presented as containing everything. It says all the fullness to dwell in him, the fullness of the whole cosmos and every body and every living thing is in him. And then by by shedding his blood, by taking his blood into the eternal, the true holy of holies, there he mingles the life of the whole world, with the life of God, with the life of the Trinity, it makes peace in this way. So again, it's like a cosmic day of atonement. Yeah, so so to talk about that just, just a little bit more, what, I guess what we're trying to say is that Christ Christ represents, as, as the priest entering the Holy of Holies represents all of Israel and in mm-hmm. some sense all of creation the whole world the brokenness of the world right mm-hmm. bringing that before the life of God right so Christ represents takes all of that all of all of creation in its state of brokenness mm-hmm. and offers it up to the life of the father mm-hmm. again through his blood, his blood. so the priest has a dual, the high priest has a dual role. He represents God to the people, right? Because when he comes back, as you said last last uh, week, mm-hmm. they worship him. He's, he, he's a, he is a theophany of yes. God, right? Mm-hmm. But he also represents um, the people or all of creation to God himself. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He intercedes in that way. And so this priestly role of Christ is something that we want to say is expressed in the cross, right? When we look at the cross, that we see the life of God. We see the, the face mm. and the heart of the Father in the Son. The image the of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. And at the same time, he's drawing all of us, all right. of 
creation in the state that it's in, as you said, it's, it's, it's brokenness, draws it into and offers it up to the Father mm-hmm. for us in that right. way. So there's that. Our, my, 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 my point is we were talking about the triune life, the relationship between the Father and the Son in the Spirit. It is actually expressed through this priestly act. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so we've talked about uh, in in, se- in seasons past how the human being is unique in the creation, right? Because you have material things that aren't alive, you have animals that are material things that live, and then you have angels that are spirit. And they don't have material bodies, at least not like we have, right? And the humans, we are. We are, are living material things, but we also have spirit. So, so we are kind of a unity of the whole of creation, or, or could be if we weren't divided against ourselves, right? We sum up everything. We sum up everything, us, because we are matter, we are animal life, and we are spirit. Uh, but Christ is all of those things and God. And he takes all those things by being the unity in the center of all these things and brings them into the very life of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it, again, to hearken back to last week with Hebrews 9, where we saw that through his death, Christ enters the eternal Holy of Holies, right? What that Holy of Holies in the ancient temple was just a model of, a copy of, a shadow of. Christ, by his death, by his blood, takes the life of everything, because he's the unity of these things, and presents them and gives them life and mingles the life of all things, the reality of all things, with um, the life of the Trinity, and that purges us of sin. That right? purifies, purifies us, us, that heals us, that draws us in, that uh, we become adopted. That means we take the role of the Son in this relationship, yeah. right? We become part of his body, we, right? We, uh, we, Christ lives in us, and we are in him, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, all of the language that we see th- all throughout the New Testament can be expressed or uh, summed up in this image of Christ, as Hebrews describes, Christ offering all of us in himself, right, Mm -hmm. to the Father through the Spirit, which is what um, Hebrews 9 says. So that's Mm -hmm. um, actually, that's the triune, that's the triune life, and that's our participation in that triune life. Um, Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that, go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, you know, we, I think we should talk about this for a second because Colossians is a book that we've gone to before and we talk about Christ being plan A not plan B right so so whether or not there's sin death and the devil the plan from the creation was for all of creation to be gathered up in Christ by the spirit presented to the father right that that Christ as the high priest is an eternal reality it's not something he just becomes because we're sinners But for him to be the center of everything and thereby for us to share in the life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the point and the goal. Now, it happens there is sin, death, and the devil. And so it's this sort of prison camp situation where it looks like a cross uh, and then resurrection, of course. But um, the point is that, that this is the life of the Trinity on display in our world, healing us, taking us up, bringing us in. And this is, in fact, the point. From the beginning, this is this too is not an exception, right? right? It's not that we have this because something went wrong somewhere. This is the point for all of the world to to in the second person, the Trinity, to in Christ by the Spirit share in the life of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. So what we want to say, if we're going to be tracing Trinity mm-hmm. in the cross, what 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 we're, what we want to say is that eternally. Christ's relationship to the Father involves him offering himself to God, Mm -hmm. right? And always in his relationship to us, always interceding for us through his own, this is going to get to one of our conversations, but through his own blood, the lamb was slain. Mm-hmm. from the foundations of the world mm-hmm. in this way. Yeah. And that that is revealed in the cross. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the reasons why the fathers don't have a theory of the atonement. They don't have a mechanism, mm-hmm. right, by which the cross solves our problem. Yeah, it's, it's not because, a puzzle. Because what they understood 
um, is that the cross is something that reveals, it reveals the eternal life of God, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's sort of like, um, how do I say it? Um, If someone didn't know you, Ethan, and I said, oh, Ethan's this great guy, and man, I I wish you knew him. And then I said, well, the only thing I could do is I got to tell you this story. Mm -hmm. And this story is about, you know, I don't know, Ethan not liking cheese. I don't know, whatever it may be. But Great I'm going to tell you this story. <laughs> Sums it up right there. He Sums hates it up. cheese. I can't think of anything better right now, brother. But there's a story. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're trying to come up with an example of how I'm a great guy. <laughs> can only think of the fact that I don't like cheese. And then, quote, I can't think of anything else right now. I can't think of anything else right now. I'm sorry. Great guy. Give me some time. Give me some time to reflect on. But anyway, so I got this story, and this story encapsulates everything about who Ethan is, right? And you're going to just be able to capture the essence of Ethan through this specific story. Mm -hmm. That's like what the cross is. You did that one thing at that one particular time, and that sums it up, Mm -hmm. right? That is who you are. And uh, that tends to uh, be the way that the fathers understand the cross. Mm -hmm. It's not a uh, fix like a, you know, like a, you know, an update on our, on our, um, you know, laptops, you know, like, you know, let's get this thing fixed. It's not like you look at it and you figure out the mechanism. You're supposed to look at the cross and, and sink deeper and deeper into the love that's on display there. The right? living mystery of yes. the Trinity there. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so my, my point is is that it's much more of an expression of yes. something eternal rather than a solution to a problem. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, one, I think that's important because what that does is, uh, one of the reasons why it's important is because at that point, my relationship to the cross changes. Hmm. Um, the cross isn't something that happened back then. Right. Um, the cross is something that is a living reality. It's an eternal reality mm-hmm. that's expressed in Jesus's life and also is, is expressed in my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So well, let's um, get there in a minute. Uh, we've got a quote from St. Athanasius here that kind of summarizes what we've seen so far in Colossians. Get me back on task, bro. Yes. Right. Maybe that could be the story. I mm-hmm. keep you on task, you know, and that that's not pretty much sums it up. All right. Uh, St. Athanasius, 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 4th century, great champion of the Nicene Creed, uh, known for his work in Christology. He writes, It is in the Spirit that the Word glorifies creation and presents it to the Father by divinizing it and granting it adoption. Now, you could come to this passage and think, oh, okay, so this is like this ancient belief in divinization. It's like the Word, that's Jesus, fills all of creation with his glory by the Spirit, and therefore it's adopted. But because Athanasius knows all these things that we said, and a lot more, uh, I think what he means by present it to the Father is actually what he does on the cross. When Th- this he, is a description of the cross. This is a description yeah. of, he becomes the center of all things by becoming incarnate, right? It's all in him. He's the representative, the head. He recapitulates everything. And in his death, by the Spirit, he presents it all mingled with his own blood, which is the life of God, to the Father. So it's all mingled with the life of Christ and the life of the Trinity, and therefore we are all adopted. Everything Christ is eternally, we are by grace, by adoption, right? Yes. There it is, and that's the cross. Yes, and it's a, a, it's a revelation of God's love as being something that's unlimited. I mm-hmm. think that, yes. you know, the cross is the place where all of every all of <laughs> human creation all of sinful creation says no to the love of god mm-hmm. and is echoed or res- god responds to it with a greater yes right? yeah so there's a sense in which the life of the life of god eternally is always yes 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 you know christ receives from the father gives back to the father in the spirit it's this constant giving, mm-hmm. this constant yes, this constant blessing, this constant glory. Now that is given to us, mm-hmm. and what we find in the Gospels is we say no. 
but what's the response? <laughs> it's Luke six, right? Mm -hmm. we, right? We 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 steal, we take, we abuse, and yet what we find in the cross is Jesus says, "Father, forgive them." They don't know. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And in that, what we find here is. Though all those no's, all that rejection, all the hatred, all the refusal of God's love is actually something that Christ takes into himself, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That's something, it's not just suffers on the outside, right? It's something, he unites himself with that sin. He becomes sin. Mm -hmm. yeah, he who knew no week. sin becomes sin. And in, our, in, and in that, right? we share in his life so that we become the righteousness yeah. of God. It's like he goes to the depths of our no to God and all of its misery and death. And in that place, he enacts the yes. Yes. Right. And I want to say, you know, we talk a lot about in the Trinity, like the father gives everything to the son, but not just his divinity. Like if we read the gospel of John carefully, the father gives the son his, his own divinity, but all of creation. And then in the cross, Christ gives it all back. Mm. He carries the whole of creation with him and hands it all back. Uh, and it's this, this life of exchange in the spirit. And the other thing I want to say about that related to this is in that la later view that we've been saying, this isn't quite right. What the cross is, is kind of a separating out. It's like, okay, you sinners, you get over there and I'll stand right here and over here and I'll take the fire and you all be okay over there. But scripturally speaking, and in the patristic theology, it's not that at all. It's gathering us all up to present us into the In other to, words, to it's, father, not, right? it's not a, a, a substitution so much as it is a unity. And in that unity, there is an exchange. It's not that there's no exchange. Yeah. We exchange our sin for his glory. That's yeah. definitely true. But the exchange is one of a shared life, not yes. a, a, a switching spots. Mm -hmm. Christ is gathering us across. God is coming to where we are fully to be with us in the depths of our alienation from God and to carry us back into the presence of his Father by means of the Spirit. So the cross isn't, you all get over there and I'll do this and separates. No, no, it's a full gathering. And it, you know, it's that prison camp situation because this is what we have made of the world. And, uh, but it's this gathering and then it's this healing. So, so there's a, there's a theologian, 20th century theologian, and I'm not going to be able to quote it perfectly, but to paraphrase, you know, the cross, the crucifixion, the cross is the love of God, the eternal love of God written in human history. That's mm -hmm. what it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. it looks like in human history. Yep. And so what we see is ourselves. Mm -hmm. the human history, the broken human history, but we also see that perfect love being expressed in this tragic situation. Yeah, yeah. And that to call it a triumph is to say then that is not just a tragic story, mm -hmm. but we are drawn into that. Exactly. Uh, so through that. Yeah. And so this drawing in has different consequences, I would say for how we live in the light of the cross then rather that l that later view, the whole take up your cross thing didn't make a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, okay, I thought it was supposed to be, but he took it so I don't have to, right? But, you know, in we're looking at Colossians 1, and then Paul goes on to say some shocking things that make sense in light of this older view we've been exploring, right? So this is just a few passages down, just a few uh, sentences down, where Paul says, he's writing to this church in Colossae, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body that's Christ's which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions so that I might fully carry out the word of God that is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations but now has been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Just a couple of things to say here. Um, Paul doesn't see Christ's sufferings as something Jesus gets, and so I don't have sufferings. He sees a union here, right? He's sharing in it. He's yeah. sharing in it for the sake of others. Yes. Right? So, so Paul... His, his life of suffering and dying is transformed, 
not because those things just go away right away, but now it's transformed by the very life of God. Now he suffers on behalf of all these people he takes care of in this church, right? Um, yeah, so basically what Paul's doing is saying, I now have a share in the triune life, mm-hmm. right, of this selfless giving because I share in the life of Christ, mm-hmm. because it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me, right? So yeah. his life is now marked in this way, and he's saying the union between him and the crucified Christ is one of a shared life now. Mm-hmm. To, right? And to be clear, if he's not a Christian, he'll still suffer. He'll still get sick. He'll still die. He'll still have hardships, but it'll just be senseless. Right. But now his sufferings have a point. They have a share. They are part of the very means by which he shares in the eternal life of God here in this sort of prison camp situation that we're in. Yeah. And then he goes on to use this, this revelation language, right? There's this hidden mystery, but it's made known. And it's Christ in you. This is the deep mysterion. Mm-hmm. In other words, that's not just because Paul's an apostle, but all of us, because Christ has gathered us up in, in the deepest, you know, even in our sins and those places of deepest alienation from God and those places where we suffer because the world's just broken or because we ourselves are sinful, all that can be gathered up. All of that can be part of that movement into the eternal holy of holies to that share the life of Trinity. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so now, you know, these yeah. things which, you know, so often I think we go to church and we just kind of live in a fantasy world about them going away. Then mm-hmm. we go back into the world and don't know what to do with them. This is but good stuff. Um, we do need to take a minute just for, I think, a answer maybe one or two of the questions that people ask. Yes, yeah, right? sorry, we went yeah. a little long. But yeah. we did get a few questions. And uh, one question we got was uh, this peculiar passage in Revelation. We've, we've, actually, we've actually quoted it a few times in here Yeah, already. let me pull it up here. It's Revelation 13.8. And I have uh, two translations uh, for those of you who can't see. Uh, One is the NASB, which is a more contemporary translation we tend to use a lot in Mysterion, and one is the old King James Version. And uh, let me read these to you. Now, this is Revelation 13. It's the chapter with the beast, which we will not talk about. Uh, But it's talking about the beast uh, persecuting the church. And John writes, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, that is the beast, Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So it makes sense. He says, you know, there will be those who worship the beast, but if your name was written in the book of life, this is Lamb's book of life, and it's been written there since the foundations of the world. That's how all the newer translations translate this passage. The older translations, like the KJV, and, and this is how the ancients read it, reads like this. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Now, that's very different, right? So in the first one, basically, the names of those who are in the book of life are there from the foundations of the world. Yes, there's this book that has your name in it. It's been there from the foundations of the world. The second one what we have is the f- the lamb is the one who was slain from the foundation of the world. Right. And there's some ambiguity in the Greek that allows it it is a possibility to translate it either way. It is a possibility to translate it in this newer way, but it's less natural. Mm-hmm. It's far more natural, and it's testified more in uh, the history of the reading of Revelation to do it this way, that the idea is that it's the lamb who's been slain from the foundations of the earth. And actually, if you read Revelation carefully, that's sort of the point. The right. one on the eternal throne is the slain lamb. So, And, and I think what we want to do, if we want to step away just from the translation issue and say what's the... Th- you know, what's some of the significance of this? It's once again what we've been trying to talk about some here today, which is that um, the cross, which is Christ's offering um, on our behalf, right? Summing up, representing, carrying, bearing all of our selves with his own life into the presence of the Father and saying, I offer this to you, mm-hmm. Father. That's something that's eternally in the life of God, yes. right? So the cross isn't something that's um, um, at its deepest root, a historical happening that changed the course of history. It's, it's, an, a, e- it's an eternal it's, happening. It's a revelation of It's a of revelation of the eternal life, life of God. Yeah. So the lamb slain from the foundation of the world is the description of 
Christ's self-giving, selfless love offered up to the Father, mm. and in relationship to a world of sin and brokenness that takes the form of the Lamb, mm-hmm. the Lamb slain. Yeah, and so, I mean, it seems a weird thing to say, right? How can he be the Lamb slain from the foundations of the earth? Was he not slain about 2,000 years ago? Well, yes, but that's a revelation of who he always, not who he eternally is, right? And then we could get really nerdy and say, you know, eternity is this fullness, right? It's this, there's not before and after in eternity. And so if at one point there's a slam lane on the throne, then there's just a slain lamb on the throne. There's always a slain lamb on the throne. God has always been united. God is eternally united to the lamb who was slain, Jesus Christ. It's not like, you know, at some point in time, the eternal son just turns into Jesus and has this episode one weekend on a cross. No, God is eternally united to that moment. It's the slain lamb on the throne. This is Jesus Christ, as Hebrew says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. The character you see there is the character on the eternal throne and ever will be. In fact, if you read Revelation closely, this passage that we think are Jesus coming and kicking butt and taking names, it's actually a manifestation of that same mystery. It's, It's still overcoming through his own sufferings, but there's no time for that. But that was a good question, like what's with it? And modern translations don't do that precisely because the translators aren't steeped in this stuff. They're steeped in that later view that we talked about. And so they just scratch their head and say, well, if it's an exception in the life of the Trinity, right? And it has to be if it's wrath being vented, that it doesn't make sense to translate it this way. But if we understand it as a revelation. Yes. Christ, Christ, Christ is the eternal son. He's also the eternal high priest. He's also the eternal lamb. He's also the ter- eternal throne or the mercy seat. Yeah. Right? He's all of those things eternally. And so, um, um, yeah. Um, do we have time for another Well, we're question 56 or, or so yeah, minutes Yeah, we're in. running out of time. Running out of time. Mm. Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll we'll hit some of these maybe through text or the text or Facebook online, yeah. or whatever. And uh, man, maybe we should do an episode soon where we do a bit more answering question and answer kind of thing. Yeah, where we just give our time that to that. Bit. Yeah, we should do that. Miss you guys. Okay, let us know if things are still <laughs> hazy in your mind, or or if there are other questions you have or things you want to have addressed. And in the meantime, we're going to keep figuring out how we're going to trace Trinity. If you guys got mm-hmm. questions or ideas, suggestions for us, let us know on the Facebook discussion group. And we thank you for everybody who's been participating lately. Mm-hmm. It's been great. Thank you. God bless.